fan club. <laughs> all right, are we all comfortable? There are some seats up front, as I said. If you need a chair. All right, good evening, everyone, and welcome to Swan Auction Galleries. Thank you for coming. Uh, my name is Lisa Crescenzo. I'm the department manager for the Prince Drawings Department. Uh, it's kind of a short title for a very large span of art. <laughs> we also handle American art, uh, sculptures, multiples of all sorts, and works on paper. You are currently sitting in the Contemporary Art Exhibition. This sale is on Thursday afternoon. And partnering tonight, we are going to have a discussion about collecting female papers from the Archives of American Art. Uh, so in our cell, we do have a bunch of female artists. And our goal, as with many people in the art industry right now, is to keep increasing the amount of visibility for female artists. So this is a great setting to kind of talk about mm -hmm. feminism. And here with me tonight, uh, we have two wonderful ladies, both curators with the archives. Erin uh, Gilbert is the curator of African American manuscripts. Erin is the curator at the Smithsonian's Archives of American Art. Uh, before joining the archives, Gilbert was an independent curator. She's also served as the director of the Kruger Gallery, director of the community engagement, audience development, and adult programs at the Studio Museum in Harlem here in New York and the Associate Director of the Leadership Advisory Committee at the Art Institute of Chicago. Welcome, Erin. Thank you. And Erin, you've been here before, correct? I have. Okay. Thank you for having me back. <laughs> so welcome back. And as well, welcome back to Mary Savig. Mary is the curator of manuscripts. She has curated numerous exhibitions and has broadly written on collections at the archives. She specializes in the acquisitions of collections documenting the history of American studio craft and all collections in the mid-Atlantic. She is the author of Handmade Holiday Cards from the 20th Century Artists and another publication called Pen to Paper, Artists Handwritten Letters from the Smithsonian Archives of American Art. She is currently a PhD candidate in American Studies at oh, the I'm University done. of Maryland. You're done. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> she lives through it. It doesn't get old. She, she, she yeah. survived. We <laughs> acknowledge it. Well, we're glad that you have finished that and you're here tonight. Dr. Mary Savig. <laughs> that wasn't holding you up from coming to New York. <laughs> Uh, so, as I said, tonight we're going to talk a bit about the archives, and uh, we at SWAN are proud to contribute to the funding of the Archives of American Art Journal, the longest running scholarly periodical devoted to the history of art in the United States. Uh, there are complimentary issues at the back table, uh, all available for you to take home tonight, and that fall issue covers Rockwell Kent, some women moder modern artists, uh, including Warden Day. I just read that article over again last night. Really, really fascinating. And Robert Smithson, as well as recent acquisitions by the archives. We are so happy to have both our speakers back. And tonight, we'll be sharing their perspective on collecting papers of women artists, curators, and dealers. So let's get started. As I mentioned, you guys are both back. This is our third event with the archives. Mary, could you describe the role of the archives a bit and the importance of collecting papers by women in the arts? Sure, yeah. So for those of you who haven't heard of the archives or you're not super familiar with our mission, our goal is to acquire, preserve, and make available the primary sources or first-hand accounts of American art. We were founded in the 1950s in Detroit, Michigan, really to create a foundation for the study of American art, then a fledgling field. Um, early on in the 1950s, we began collecting the papers of women artists, women dealers, including uh, Edith Halpert's papers in the downtown gallery records. And I just mentioned that because there's been some great buzz on uh, Helpert's show at the Jewish Museum, and we lent some documents from the downtown gallery records to that show, and they're also fully digitized and available on our website for you to browse. Mm -hmm. So since the 1950s, we've been really building on collections by or about women in the American art world. 
Right now, we have the biggest collection of women artists, about it, women artists everywhere in the world, anywhere in the world. And that includes some of my favorites, includes, since we're in front of some Helen Frankenthaler's uh, snapshots of Helen Frankenthaler and Lee Krasner on a Hamptons beach, studio portraits of Alma Thomas in her Washington, D.C. home studio, uh, beautiful intricate collage postcards by Lenore, fiber artist Lenore Tani, watercolor sketches by another artist named Kay Sakamachi, who made these watercolors while she was incarcerated at the Tan Fran uh, Assembly Center during World War II. Um, and we have some great portraits of Louise Nevelson's cats, <laughs> Couscous and Fat Fat in her studio. <laughs> Um, so yeah, all of these documents together really help tell a more complete picture of American art. They speak to women's experiences as artists at particular moments in our art history and culture. And in addition to the papers of women artists, we also include, uh, we also focus on dealers, curators, scholars, and collectives some really exciting new acquisitions that we're anticipating a lot of research requests into are the papers of Linda Auckland that Finding Aid was just finished. So maybe you want to try to make a research appointment soon if you want to see them. And also the Andrea Rosen Gallery records. Both of these came in in 2019. Great. Mm -hmm. There's always something new you guys are collecting. Yes. So it's nice to hear <laughs> what's been added. I know mm -hmm. our staff uh, uses the archives digitized all the time to piece out information in our provenance for consignment. So it's a really useful mm -hmm. tool. Thank you for your work. Good to hear that. Uh, well, in September of this year, the New York Times reported that female artists have made little progress in museums since 2008. Uh, in fact, amongst the country's top museums, that number is 11%. Can you comment, Mary, about the rate at which the archives is trying to mm -hmm work on that initiative and how you compare yourselves in the collecting world to how museums are handling uh, sure. female yeah. artists? Great question. So in, um, we've always been collecting the papers of women artists and dealers and art world figures. In 2013, we began a feminist collecting initiative. And this was really to focus on the activism of the 60s and 70s for two reasons. The first was, um, you know, there's so much research that's now looking at American art, broadly at American art through a feminist lens. So a lot of curators and researchers and students are looking back very generally on art history, and they're rewriting these narratives to focus more on women. Lee Krasner, Hedda Stern, instead of looking through the lens of their partners, they are focusing more and more on women. Um, and then also there's, of course, been more attention on the feminist movement, and also these artists who were uh, pioneers of feminism who really um, established feminist formations and networks in the art world, they are starting to become of an age where they are looking back and thinking about where to place their papers. So for us, it was really this importance of meeting research needs and growing ever-increasing interest in the topic of feminism and also to, because it is also a time when uh, we would start looking back at the artists who are at the point in their career where they're looking back. I think we can all agree that yeah. there seems to be a big feminist movement in the arts for the past decade or so. Sure, yeah, and a lot of, a lot of fellows have come through. And so with more and more demand, we know we have to meet that need with research and try to stay ahead of trends. So I think about right now, about since 2013, about one third of our collections have been by or about women, and we have done about 40% of our oral history interviews have been with women. Of course, we still need to do more, like everybody does, to uh, achieve parity in the art world. Uh, but I'm happy to say that we are ahead of the museum statistics. Great. <laughs> That's wonderful. Uh, we're all trying, even here at SWAN, to mm -hmm. continue each of our departments integrating more female voices. Um, in this sale, we have about 15% of the artists represented are women, which is much more than years past. So we are too proud to <laughs> be able to offer more. Um, last question for you, Mary, uh, at this moment. Uh, are there any particular artist papers that you've acquired just this year that you feel have expanded the collection in a new direction? Mm -hmm. So my favorite acquisitions are one that's actually not coming till next year because um, I worked with the Kohler Art Center in Sheboygan, Wisconsin 
on an exhibition about an artist named Lenore Tawney. The Kohler Art Center, if you're not familiar with it, they specialize in artist environments. So they acquired her entire studio. And then the studio is exhibited, along with all of these other um, artist-built environments. So they did this major exhibition. And there's a, there's a catalog if you don't want to take a few flights to get to Sheboygan, Wisconsin. <laughs> What's the closest uh, city there? Yeah. You have to like, fly into Milwaukee, okay. and then you drive up. Oh. Uh, you can also drive up from Chicago. <laughs> But um, so it, I think that speaks to once the exhibition closes, the archives will come to us. But I do think it speaks to this growing trend within a lot of museums to rather than use archives as a footnote or citing us as footnotes, they're really thinking through the artworks and the entire artist legacy with archives, and they become part of the process. So what was really exciting uh, with the Lenore Tawney project is I wrote extensively about her own archives and thinking about the difference of scale in her artworks from her, her collage correspondence that was in a very small form to these huge, massive weavings that she did um, in her studio loft in New York that was a sailor's, um, a sail-making loft. So she was able to do these huge artworks. And being able to just think about how she made art and how it was completely connected to also how she constructed her archive is, I think, a growing curatorial practice. Um, Two other exciting collections that just came in are the papers of a public artist named Athena Taka. She is an artist who really drew a con her conceptual framework from land artists. She was really focused on philosophy and ecologies. Um, she was also really serious about making sure that she was creating these public spaces that were useful to communities, where people could really come and meditate in them and feel like they um, could use them as part of their everyday life. So in addition to documenting a lot of her interest in ecology and philosophy, they also show her patience with bureaucracy and the way that she really fought for making sure that her, her public sculptures, which included mazes and fountains and plazas, would actually be something that people would appreciate and not just see like it is something that they had to work around and they wanted to be part of it. And then finally, the papers of Judith Schechter. She's a stained glass artist in Philadelphia. Um, like a lot of craft artists, her papers document her virtuosity and skill of this very historical medium of stained glass. And it also shows how she's taken this very metaphorical and reverent material of stained glass and how she's really transformed it into something that speaks to conceptual um, idioms about being a woman and about really macabre subjects that she's working through that are very irreverent for the medium. So her sketchbooks show they really reflect her consciousness and they're very raw and they're really um, beautiful formations of where her artwork is going. So we're really excited to make these available That's to That's great. People. How long does it take to make an archive available? Just oh, well, as soon as, as soon as I describe it in yeah. our database <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and our registrar puts it on the shelf, it's available, wow. Danny. It's freely available. That's so great. Mm -hmm. It'll Wonderful. be pretty soon, yeah. I look forward to it. Mm -hmm. OK, Erin, um, I have a few questions for you about your role at the archives. Uh, during your time, you've brought in a number of collections from African-American women. Can you talk about some of those collections and maybe one of your favorites <laughs> and or a special thing that you want, you remember that was important to you about the work you've no, been doing? Happily. Thank you again for having me back. And um, it's great to be able to speak about some of these artists in a little more depth. Um, I have been focused on abstract conceptual and performance practices particularly of women artists. Mm -hmm. um, it's been a dearth across the field, and so one that I felt compelled to address immediately as well, especially as generations shift. And we were at a pivotal place with many artists. Um, I'll begin with a New York artist, which some of you may know. Her name is Betty Blayton Taylor. And Betty Blayton Taylor is an abstract artist who, I see a head nodding. You're a bit familiar <laughs> with her. I love that. Um, but she was thinking about the metaphysical, the transcendent, and the spiritual qualities of artistic practice. Most of her canvases were round, and many of them used um, pastels to really illuminate this idea of 
what we're not seeing on a daily basis when we um, enter into a conversation with uh, another human being. But um, uh, the images we have of her are some beautiful black and white shots by Camille Billups in her studio in Harlem really attempt to position her historically as a painter. But for those of you who may know Betty Blayton Taylor was very deeply involved in community building and very deeply involved in art education. She began as the program coordinator for MoMA's outreach to inner city youth in New York. Mm -hmm. And from that, uh, hosted these chicken and chili parties at her home. And it was at one of the chicken and chili parties where she invited the young collectors group of the MoMA curator uh, collectors to come over and they conceived of what we know, now know as a studio museum in Harlem. Um, in 1965, the idea was conceived and in 1968, the museum was founded and Betty served as the board secretary through 1977. She was deeply involved in that process and moved on to then mm -hmm found the Children's Art Carnival, where many of the artists that you know and love and some that we've collected now, including Senga Nengudi, got their financial backing as artists and had another community of artists to draw on um, as mentors in that space, and then founded the Harlem Textile Works to be able to address the intersection of art and what one would think of as wearable art. She was also on the board of the Robert Blackburn printmaking mm -hmm. studio. Mm -hmm. So she was really one for whom, in looking at all of those papers, you see the sacrifice of a painting practice for art administration and in many ways an informal art administration. So her papers are not just filled with some sketches and, and some renderings, but many agendas and meeting minutes notes and, and notes mm -hmm. and really a discussion about what it meant to try to create an art community for African Americans at this really pivotal period of the late 60s and early 1970s. Um, I was able to uh, meet her while she was still living in my time in Harlem, and so it was very special to have met her, but then after she passed, be able to go back and have conversations with her um, brother and nephew around retrieving her papers. And mm -hmm. we went to the Bronx in the storage unit and got them, and so they've been um, at the archives now and are being used by um, writers and scholars um, for things like magnetic fields and other exhibitions that are really focused now on abstract African-American women artists. I think another kind of highlight for me and an artist that you may be familiar with is um, Beverly Buchanan. Beverly Buchanan is known for these um, rural shacks, these kind of shanties that she created. Um, she was born in South Carolina and studied parasitology. She studied medicine. It, she really thought that she would um, work in that field. And it was the case that she took a course with Norman Lewis at the Art mm -hmm. Students League in 1971, and that changed her trajectory entirely. She committed to artistic practice, but drew on her experiences as a young person in the South, really traveling with her father, who was an administrator in um, public housing, as one might call it, at the time, and just riding through those spaces and seeing the crude conditions of African-American life, she decided it was really important to try to render, um, not just in sculpture, for which she's known these um, wooden shacks, but then also in pigment drawings, and then also in poetry. So what we now have at the archives um, is the information from all of her educational experience, um, information around her father's practice and how that influenced her, um, her diaries, her notebooks, her sketchbooks, which are illustrated and truly gorgeous, um, but then also the poetry that went along with many of these um, sculptural works she actually photographed and attached by staple. So in this so she was a good archivist. She was, yeah. she was archivist. <laughs> and she was really conscious of the fact that having moved back, I didn't mention this, but she moved back to Macon, Georgia in 77 after establishing relationships with Robert Rauschenberg and Anna Mendieta and Lucy Lepard and Lowry Stokes Sims. She moved back and took pictures of herself that she would send to all of them. She took selfies in this <laughs> really amazing kind of um, rudimentary self-portraiture, and she saved many of them. So we have, I think, thousands wow. of Polaroids, black and white and full color, of um, Beverly Buchanan really writing herself into a story that she thinks she, as in a living moment, thought she might have been left out of just because mm -hmm. media attention 
wasn't in the South in that moment. Um, her papers were at the time of my arrival being held by a friend in whose home she passed away in Ann Arbor, Michigan. So I went there and collected them, and it's really great to see that um, we also collected the papers that the Brooklyn Museum had used in her last solo exhibition. So what we have is a very thorough um, collection around her life, and one that has been used already by scholars internationally, and in, in a surprising way to me, once people were aware of it, they literally came from Berlin to um, wow. use those papers. So it's, it's great to be able to um, assist with the process of preserving those artists' legacies. It sounds that the artists that you just mentioned were very good at recording themselves, which we all know most artists aren't. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's really lovely to see an artist actually take note of their own history in the present moment for the future. Yeah, yeah that's really important. Um, I'm sure there are artists that the archives have collected with very very limited papers, True. I'm sure. And it varies. It does yeah. vary on how important one. You, you get the sense that mm -hmm. there's a point at which one understands one's own importance. And mm -hmm. when they understand it is when they begin to hold on to things differently. Yeah. Um, and for some people, it's really early. I think at the age of six. And for some people, it happens right after that <laughs> MFA. Um, but they, they do generally know that they want there to have been an imprint and that it should not just be the work on the walls. Yeah. And mm -hmm. so it, it varies, but women do collect well. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> We're very organized. <laughs> um, I was honored to be at the gala last month where the archives honored Howard Dina Pindell, a working woman, working artist, African American mm -hmm. here in New York. And she does a good bit of traveling for her age. <laughs> She's in her 70s, and uh, could you touch a little about working with her, someone who's had such a long career, and you're working with Alive at the moment, can answer lots of questions. I'm sure you're <laughs> eager to always have her attention. I am. I think we are. And I will say that the conversation with Howardina began before I arrived, and I was able to pick up on it. And it's been amazing that we were able to honor her. And I think um, she has enjoyed what is a beautiful moment in her career where she is, I think, finally being recognized in many ways for her innovations in artistic practice. Um, for those of you who may have seen her work either um, at the MCA Chicago retrospective or the Rose Museum, it did travel, but Howard Dina's um, large kind of um, unstretched canvases really are um, about accumulation and coding, and they are filled with thousands of tiny hole punches, thousands of tiny dots. And they have numbers on them sometimes. Often it's just a monochromatic scene covered with talcum powder and or glitter and or perfume. They're in injecting the feminine presence in many ways. But Howard Dina, um, as you said, has had a very long career. And for a grand part of it, wasn't recognized in this way. Um, she studied at Yale. That's where she got her MFA after some time at Boston University. And then came out and served in various roles at uh, MoMA as one of the first African-American curators there in the prints and illustrated books department. Um, but one pivotal moment in Howardina's life is that she had a car accident in 1979 which, um, in which she suffered a brain injury. So uh, Howardina is brilliant in having reinvented herself and having taken that experience and really woven it into what she uh, has contributed to the canon both again as an artist and as an administrator. Um, she was one of the founding members of the AAR gallery and even helped name it. Um, and then in the process of that experience, co-founded other organizations around African-American women artists presence in New York. Um, and we are in the process now of determining how much of all of this material that she has really accumulated over the last 50-some sure, <laughs> years um, will come to us. And I will say, based on the fact that she's also a full-time teacher, she's been teaching at Stony Brook University for 40 years. She will not leave the classroom. She's amazing <laughs> in the fact that she wants to be able to pass down what she's learned to people. So she's very busy, and she's, she's so busy and, and using a lot of the material right now that we are really sorting through. And I think one of the wonderful parts of this process is when someone is alive to be able to help us curate what their legacy looks like and help us make determinations on 
what should come. Um, there are things that I've learned from her, like uh, the Black Hornet letters. Then these Black Hornet letters are the alias that she worked under and wrote, mm. hand wrote by, and then saved a copy and then sent a copy and has asked and has um, responses to these letters. So those are some of the things that we hope uh, will soon come to us. We know they will come eventually, but will right. soon come. Um, she had a long-standing relationship with Lowry Stokes Sims, who presented the award to her. They traveled to Ghana together, and the records of that experience we will also have. But it changed the way in which she began to incorporate culture and national identity into uh, what became the autobiography series. So there's a beautiful linkage between um, the paintings and her papers. And one I think is perhaps the most important, and the papers we do have now um, are from her father, Howard uh, Pindell. And her father was an administrator, a school teacher, who in fact sued the uh, district of uh, the Department of Education at a certain point for discrimination in hiring and promotion practices. Uh, the case was actually tried by Thurgood Marshall, um, went on for many years, and they did win. Um, and so we have those papers. And as Howard Eden and I talked about why this was so important, she said, well, you know, um, I was traveling with my father to Ohio. We stopped at a lunch counter, and I had a root beer float. And at the bottom of the float, there was a red dot. She said, and I asked my father, why was there a red dot at the bottom of our glass? And he said, because the red dots indicate the glasses and the dishes that people of color, mm -hmm. African Americans, could use in the segregated South. So this dot had been etched in her memory at a very early age, and that repetition, that, that kind of resonance with the dot has multiple meanings. It, does represent that whole punching experience at wow. MoMA, but it is also very much about seeing that dot with her father. Oh, wow, that's <laughs> quite moving. Um, can you talk about the difference between some of the oral histories that the archives records versus just a regular interview? And I know that uh, the archives has the largest collection of oral histories around the world. So I'd love to have you share with everyone what an oral history is and how that's really different and how you approach that. All right. Well, our long form oral histories are, I think, an amazing opportunity for artists to tell their entire story from birth to the present moment, really unencumbered. I think the difference between our oral histories and many interviews is that we don't have an agenda. We really are interested in the artist telling their story. Um, generally speaking, the narrator has the choice of whom they'd like to be in the conversation with. Mm -hmm. And that person is really encouraged not to give many prompts not to ask many questions, but really just to be there as a sounding board and the occasional response when the artist needs to move to another part of a story. Um, we don't really ask them about a particular series or a particular body of work or a particular exhibition. We're really interested in the entire span of life and the entire set of relationships that have informed their practices from their parents to their siblings to their teachers to fellow students and colleagues in the field who may have informed the way or the way in which they create and present work. Um, and so they generally take place over three to five days. Wow. And so for a number of hours, and we generally have an output of between five and 10 hours. Sometimes they've gone longer, but you can imagine the kind of endurance it takes and at a particular age, yeah. the kind of memory one needs to have to be able to, to tell those stories. Yeah. And so I think it's an honor on both sides always for both the narrator and the person engaged in that conversation to be able to hear those it sounds stories. sounds like a vocal diary entry that just is very, very long. <laughs> it is. And yeah. that you, I think you're surprised by the things people remember, what their triggers are. You yeah. think you're just talking about a particular year or maybe even particular mm -hmm. work of art, and it moves into this direction that you didn't expect. And that's wonderful, because it's not something on the CV or bio. It's mm -hmm. something that they would have to tell you. Um, I had the honor to, to do a uh, oral history with Barbara Chase Rabot in Paris, where she's lived for over 50 years now. And Barbara Chase Rabot was important because she's a sculptor, an African American um, sculptress, but who has lived in Paris since she finished her Yale, her MFA at Yale. And so um, she's worked abroad and in many ways has felt forgotten um, and has in many ways not been able to participate in 
a series of conversations in an ongoing manner in the US. So it was very important for her to be able to share her story. Um, she's also a writer, and so um, we were able to talk about um, the ways in which there's a relationship between her written work and her sculpting about this idea of monument and memorializing forgotten figures that she has really been focused on in both practices. Um, in the literary uh, world, you may know of the Sally Hemings novel. Barbara Chase Rabot wrote the Sally Hemings novel and um, you know, was ostracized for many years, 20 years, for having told the story of Thomas Jefferson. And um, at the time of her telling it, there was no DNA, ev no DNA evidence. Um, she had simply traveled to the sites and gathered enough information to write this book. But 20 years later, the DNA evidence did come back to prove that this was um, a, a woman with whom he had been engaged in a long-term relationship. Um, another important, I think, story and interesting for me to hear was about a second novel she'd written called Echo of Lions. And Echo of Lions uh, actually became the film Amistad, uh, produced by Steven Spielberg in 1997. And um, because she wasn't credited in any of the writing of the film, although they had read the novel, she actually did sue them and won. Um, the case, but it's very interesting to hear her talk about what it meant to be isolated from Hollywood in a certain way after having written what was a very important historical novel that had resonance with the world over, um, but not really being able to be a part of celebrating that or talking mm. about how she um, had researched to create that novel. So all this is in an oral history now available at the Archives of American Art. <laughs> so please feel free to you know request Are it. Are the oral histories just for artists or are they for family members, friends, colleagues, and everyone? Everyone. They're right. open to everyone. Yeah. yeah, context is so important. Yeah. So you learn something new, I'm sure, from every single person you interview. Um, so we're talking about feminist art and the feminist movement in art and how we're always growing that category. Mary, can you talk a little bit about your upcoming exhibition sure. that's down in DC and how that ties in? Yeah, so uh, we have a small gallery, a small but mighty gallery <laughs> in Washington, DC in the Donald W. Reynolds Center for American Art and Culture, which is more informally known as the place that has the Obama portraits. <laughs> so when you make, you know, when you make the trip to see the Obama portraits, gallery. We have an exhibition open that's going to open next Tuesday called What is Feminist Art? And it is held in conjunction with this broad, it's called the Smithsonian American Women's History Initiative. And it is a pan-institutional initiative that is really trying to engage and galvanize research on women throughout the Smithsonian Institution. So this is trying to um, produce a lot of exhibitions and publications about women in jazz and astrophysics and um, you know tropical research and everything. We're trying to get tell all of these stories and amplify the voices of women across collections. So when this was announced a few years ago, I began thinking about what we would do for this initiative. And I kept going back to the women's building records that we have. They were donated to the Archives of American Art in 1991. The women's building is a, was a feminist cooperative that was founded in 1973 in Los Angeles by Judy Chicago, uh, art historian Arlene Raven, <clears throat> and graphic designer Sheila DeBretville as a way for women to be able to take courses, uh, organize, um, and also organized shows. There was a gallery, and there was a historical studies research center. So in 1977, at the gallery, there was an exhibition titled What is Feminist Art, curated by Lucy Lepard, Arlene Raven, and Ruth Ishkin. And they uh, asked the question to about 200 people who responded on a little pink postcard. <laughs> it said, what is feminist art or what could it be? And the parameters were that you could say whatever you wanted to say. You just had to respond on an eight and a half by 11 piece of paper. So they have more than 200 responses. And we all have these in the women's building records. And I love it because it's a very, it's an active collection. So I think we think of archives as being very passive. You know, artists are corresponding with each other, they're making sketches, but that all kind of gets set aside and it becomes sort of this passive accumulation of materials. The curators of the show really 
thought, okay, well, feminism is a term in the art world in 1976 that was very much still in formation. People were really grappling with what it would mean to be a feminist artist. So they endeavored to make a snapshot. They, they took the pulse of all of these artists, and that became an active collection where they were very conscious, as we were talking about before, of creating historical records. And we have all of these, and it's always been really interesting to go through them because they remain really compelling. They remain really challenging because you feel frustrated because a lot of the issues that women raise are still concerns in the art world. Um, and so we wanted to show those. And we also thought, in the spirit of the original show, let's ask this question again to say, take the temperature, to take the snapshot in 2019. And this shows also the fluid nature of historical documents because things that were very um, high priorities or felt like very urgent concerns in the 1970s, you can see these shifts and how these documents may be, maybe have changed in tone or interpretation depending on the viewer. So in the 1970s, there's a lot of work that you might imagine, like a lot of goddess worship, <laughs> a, lot of, a lot of vaginas, a lot of discussion about you, being a woman the, the and body, having a vagina yeah. and that makes you, mm -hmm. that makes you a feminist. You. <laughs> So we wanted to offer the original participants the, the idea, the chance to respond again. So oh, wow. we're showing the original responses, but include, which include a lot of artists from Anna Mendieta, Martha Rosler, Anna, um, Harmony Hammond, Judy Chicago, of course. Um, and then we also, if they wanted to, they could respond again to comment on what has or hasn't changed, and that was really interesting. Will those be on display? They're all gonna be on display. And then we also, so with the original show, the majority of participants were white women. And that seemed like a very, we couldn't just exhibit that, that seemed like it certainly would not represent mm -hmm. the ways in which feminism has changed. Also the ways in which, in the 1970s, it was, um, it, it does show a lot of the reach of the women's building and some of the challenges that a lot of feminist sins have called out about the 1970s movement. So I worked with a, with a committee of curatorial advisors to reach out to a new cohort of contemporary artists who would respond again to the question. And that included um, my committee, just to give them a shout out, was Alexandra Chang, who is a curator and an art professor at NYU's Asia Pacific Research Center, now Bustamante, who is a performance artist and teaches MFA art at the USC Roski School of Art in Los Angeles. Uh, Legacy Russell, she's a curator of education at the Studio Museum of Harlem in Harlem, and um, Jacqueline Rossell, who is an uh, activist and artist based in New Mexico, who founded the organization um, grown up Navajo. And we just would have conference calls about who, who's working in contemporary art today, whose work engages with issues of gender and sexuality and feminism. And we uh, were really deliberate about making sure we were including artists of color, LGBTQ and non-binary artists. And we sent the call out again. And so we're exhibiting these new calls and we're really excited. You'll be able to come into the gallery immersed and hopefully find ways of identifying with statements then and now and sort of seeing juxtapositions, seeing the ways in which we can celebrate feminism and then also continue the conversation to so show how the discourse has changed over and time. And how long is the exhibition open for? It'll be open for a full year. So it opens Great. next Tuesday and then it'll be open through November 2020. The year of the woman is 2020. Well, I'll get down to DC, that's for sure. Yes, come down. <laughs> um, I think that wraps about the questions I had for you ladies. And uh, now I'm gonna extend the Q&A out to the audience. Does anyone have a particular question? We do have a mic, so just give us a moment. That way everyone can hear what you have to say. Uh, look up front here, Lauren. Just a moment. Thank you. I really don't have a question, but as an adjunct to this very, very interesting performance and <laughs> I want to tell you something about how important the archives is in terms of women. You may have seen a photograph of Edith Gregor Halpert, mm -hmm. one of the most extraordinary women uh, dealers who we've ever had. Now uh, I urge you if you haven't to go to the Jewish Museum because there's a marvelous exhibition 
paying tribute to her because she was a singular woman in the world of American art at that time. And what's interesting about it is <clears throat> that she promised us her papers after a lot of wrangling many, many years ago. And she said she'd give them to us with the stipulation that they could not be opened for 25 years. Well, 25 years passed, and then wonderful Miss Pollock wrote a very, very good book about her based on the archives uh, holdings. And the archives holdings can be seen, too, at the Jewish Museum now with this extraordinary exhibit. So it shows you really the significance of what we're doing here at the archives. Do we have another question? Yes, I do. Oh. Just one question is, is that Jewish Museum is when they talk about the town or yeah. the town? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, I do. Great. Okay, fine. My question is, I wanted to ask you, do you ever heard of the Nawa National Association of Women Artists? They were based in here in New York, they still are. And they're having a very difficult time. They used to be on 4th, 14th Street well, and, and 5th Avenue, and now they're on 39th. It's very sad to see an organization that has been diminished for all the wonderful women artists. And I am gonna ask you with all my heart to reach out to NAWA, National Association of Women Artists. They need your help because there are so many wonderful female artists, obviously they embrace it, and also LGBTQ. I have a, an aunt, uh, she is a transgender now, she was in charge of a bank, and she's now a photographer. Mm -hmm. They embraced her. And they just said, well, come into our organization. So I would ask you from my heart to try to help Nawa. And I'd be more than happy to hook up afterwards so you, I tell you where to talk to, whatever. But I, they really need your help. So thank you so much thank for you. everything. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? In your discussion of female artists, you know, when it all started, a lot of female artists refused to ex be exhibited as in an exhibition of women artists. Do you include those comments and that thinking? Um, it was the a very, there yeah. was a very lot of arguments mm -hmm. about whether you wanted to be included or not included. And there are a lot of very famous women artists who refused to show as a woman artist, I mean, are you including, as I said, are you including those, well, that information? Well, in the 77, yeah, in the 77 show, that was certainly part, of, I, the 77 show did a great job of mapping that discourse. Uh, June Wayne has a great response, as does Elizabeth Whitney Quisgard, basically saying, you know, I don't want to be called a feminist artist, it detracts from the, my, my possibility mm -hmm. for success, and they're calling out some problems of feminism at that time that were certainly part of the discourse, which is great about the 1977 show, and also hopefully what we're trying to do for 2019 is to show that this is very much an active discourse, and it continues to be a conversation, and that there are no easy definitions, and that in many ways, the continue, like these historical records show that this, is, this resists easy definition. So there really are these answers that I think a lot of people can identify with, uh, depending on where they are in their life or their, their experiences. So that's a great question. Can you talk a little bit more about the Andrea Rosen archive and your choice to include women art dealers in your collection? Do you want to? Sure. Um, the Andrea Rosen archive was um, collected last year by our colleague um, who worked primarily out of New York, the New York collector. And the goal is always to collect the papers of um, galleries once the gallery is dissolved. We no, we no longer take 
active gallery records, as you can imagine, that creates a context where we're a bit more like a storehouse that's mm -hmm. being used more frequently than um, is necessary by the original donor. And so we only take the records of dealers once a gallery has closed. But because we have something like the Leo Castelli records, for instance, we have a long history of representing major dealers and you know Betty Parsons, amazing women-led uh, um, organizations, Paula Cooper Gallery, the Dwan Gallery records. So we have consistently um, collected those papers. And Andrea Rosen, obviously, based on her contribution to the field over the years that she was active, was one with whom we would have no question about what to collect. It's always about how much to collect. And so we do have over 100 linear feet of material um, based on her um, galleries, um, you know, transactions over a number of years. But um, if there are any more questions you'd like for us to answer, I'm happy to address them afterwards. Oh. In your, you know, shedding light on the art world, because yeah. of course artists are important. But what about the people who facilitated the artist's livelihood? Of I think it's, yeah. do you find that you're unique to that in in terms of institutions supporting the arts? A lot of institution repositories do collect uh, deal. There are some of our most access collections are the papers of galleries mm -hmm. because there's so many different ways of asking questions from these records. So if you have 20 to 30 artists in your stable, so many more people are coming to that because mm -hmm. they're coming from a broad range of interests. Like Leo Costelli, we have Jasper John scholars. We have Lee Bonacue. And then we also have people who are looking very broadly at, move, at movements. So they are our most accessed collections. And I think <laughs> other repositories would say the same. Mm -hmm. But our most accessed collections are Leo Costelli, I think, um, downtown, yeah, yeah. Crowshower, yeah. Macbeth We've galleries. We've used the downtown gallery. Yeah. Ang yeah. Ankrum Gallery, Steinbach. Yeah. 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 yeah, still in business. Yeah, still in business. Well, and then Andrea Rosen, when that is, when there's a finding aid, I'm sure it's going to be <laughs> very, some time. very, yeah. very Big high collection, demand. but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, okay. I do not. We have a question back here. Yeah. Great. I would love to. Did you get her records? And my other question is, how do you encourage people to leave their records? I mean, I assume you got Virginia's records. If not, you know, that's a real crisis because yeah, we're... Yeah, we have some, I think we have some. Yeah, yeah. the, the broader piece. question, I guess, yeah. is, I guess the collections can come to you in many ways, right? Mm -hmm. While the artists or the dealers are still alive, uh, maybe they happen years after their passing, um, kind of like how we collect art for our sales. We mm -hmm. get them in a variety of uh, lanes, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, so what's probably the most common kind of path for getting those papers or papers in general? Is that conversation started Years Sometimes in it's advance. when we're on panels yeah. and people come up to us after. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but we have priorities, of course, institutional yeah. priorities. And we do, I think, reach out, generally speaking, to the people that we're aware of in terms of their contribution, their innovations. And we reach out by letter, by phone, by email, by showing up personally and having conversations. We conduct studio visits and we conduct meetings with um, not just living artists, but the heirs of those who've gone on. Um, but we are very cognizant of the fact that we also rely on scholars and on curators who are doing in a research on artists we may not be aware of and who are trying to amplify the knowledge of a certain artist, dealer, collector, or art historian. And so we are always open to having conversations about the artists we're not as familiar with and mm -hmm. to exploring how they may fit within the scope of um, artists, dealers, collectors, and art historians whose papers we are collecting. So feel free mm -hmm. to send suggestions. All right, well, I want to thank everyone for attending, and thank you. Was there one more question, or are we good? We're good? All right. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. And the bar my is open. Broke Please oh, my nail broke go grab a drink, and make sure you take a, a catalog and a journal on your way out. Thank you.